Hello, everybody. I'm Eugenio Biagini, speaking to you from Cambridge, where we've been running this uh, webinar, series of webinars on the future of the island of Ireland. Um, I should start by uh, besides welcoming you uh, following this webinar this evening by thanking Sydney Sussex College for hosting uh, this series and indeed the Center for Geopolitics, which is our main support and the uh, providers of so much of the facilities which en enable us to speak to you this evening. But now I would like to invite Barry Kolfer to introduce the speakers and start the proceedings. Barry. Thanks, Min and Eugenio. Good evening, everybody, and good, indeed, good afternoon, friends joining in North America. It's a real pleasure to be with you again for this, our 19th meeting of this Cambridge series on the future of the island of Ireland. Uh, we have a, a really exciting uh, event in store tonight. I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be talking about this central topic of uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly elections, what happens now. Unusually, for those who followed our series, we don't just have one speaker and a conversant tonight, we have three speakers, so a panel, and I'm going to introduce those to you in turn now. Our panellists will include Frame Clements, Northern Ireland, Northern Editor with the Irish Times and co-author of Children of the Troubles, the untold story of the children killed in the Northern Ireland conflict, which was the winner of the best Irish published book at the Irish Book Awards 2019. Thanks for being with us, Freya. Freya will be joined by Lisa Clare Whitten, Research Fellow in Politics at Queen's University of Belfast and the ESRC funded project on governance for a place between the multi-level dynamics of implementing the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. Then finally, third panelist, we're going to have Michael Darcy, Senior Research Associate, who's a Senior Research Associate at the Centre for Cross-Border Studies. Michael has also supported the work of the IBEC CBI, so IBEC being the Irish CBI, Joint Business Council, and has been central to Northside economic interactions for the past 30 years. As we'll see, the speakers are going to reflect on the current political and economic landscape in Northern Ireland, and indeed how this, what implications this might have across the island. We talk about the protocol, the meaning of a Sinn Féin victory, and much more. So without further ado, thank you all again for being with us. I'm going to pass you over to Niamh, but just to remind everybody to please make use of the questions and answers function. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Thanks a million. Niamh. Great. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, this evening. So we're going to have a slightly different format tonight. Um, I'm going to begin by asking the panellists very brief questions to get us all up to speed with where, where Northern Ireland currently is today. And then we'll have our usual interventions followed by conversation and then the Q&A. So with without further ado, uh, Freya, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. And I was hoping you can give us a, a sort of brief, brief history uh, why Stormont isn't sitting um, despite the elections on the 5th of May. Uh, thank you, Niamh. Um, I'll do my best to keep it brief. I could talk about this all, all day and indeed write about this all day and sort of frequently have. But um, just to sort of set set the scene a bit and, and apologies in advance if this is kind of going too basic, but just to make sure kind of everybody understands wh where we are, that the, the system of government, the devolved government in Northern Ireland is based on mandatory power sharing coalition, which was the, the agreement sort of come up with um, in, in the Good Friday Agreement. And that's to ensure that power is shared between unionists and nationalists, although one of the really interesting things we saw in the last election is, is the increase in the category of those who designate as others and that's something that we'll sort of come back to um, so it means represent, representation in the executive is shared out under the DeHunt mechanism to ensure that there's sort of a fair re representation so in the last assembly we had five parties in the executive um, and certain decisions require cross-community support and this is sort of where, where a bit of the sticking point came in if you like um, in terms of the, the first and deputy first minister um, one cannot hold power with the other and broadly speaking certainly up until this point one has been a unionist and one has been a, been a nationalist what happened and kind of how we got to the current crisis uh, was triggered by the resignation of the then uh, first minister of the DUP's Paul Given in February and that's part of the the DUP's campaign against the Northern Ireland protocol so political unionism in Northern Ireland broadly speaking is it is opposed to the protocol they differ in in how to deal with them with them but um the DUP wants it scrapped or, or, or removed and so they took the decision to withdraw the first minister and what that did was that then meant Michelle O'Neill the Sinn Féin deputy first minister couldn't hold power either and it meant that the executive was effectively in a sort of a 
a zombie format. It was there, but it couldn't take major decisions. Now, of course, since then, we've had an election um, to form an assembly again after election. Again, you need that cross community support. Um, and we didn't even get post election to the decision about first and deputy first minister, because obviously, now Sinn Féin is the largest party, the landscape has changed. Sinn Féin would be entitled to the first minister role and the DUP to the deputy role. But actually, we didn't even get that far because the DUP wouldn't agree on, on the appointment of a speaker, which again has to have that cross-community consent. So because a speaker couldn't be appointed, no assembly business can, can take part. So we now have this sort of limbo situation whereby there's no assembly the outgoing ministers remain in a caretaker capacity, but they can't really take any major decisions. So we're in limbo. And the lesson of experience, if you like, in Northern Ireland is that once we get to that place, it can take quite a long time to put things back together again. Brilliant, Freya. Great job. I mean, a lot of events covered in a very short space of time. So well done. Well done, you. Um, Lisa, so then turning to you. The assembly elections happened with the single transferable vote mechanism. I was wondering if you might say a little bit about why Northern Ireland uses STV, kind of like a PR system, um, and how this might differ to other parts of the UK. Sure, thanks, and thanks for uh, the invitation to be here. Um, so as you say, STV uh, is a proportional representation system. Historically in Northern Ireland, um, there has been um, difficulties around minority representation. And so the proportional, the proportionality kind of function um, is important and was part of the 1998 agreement um, provisions, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement provision, uh, because it allows for um, more representative results and government based on the election. I'll go through, um, hopefully not uh, bore you too much with detail, but um, I think it's helpful to run through the system to see how that principle um, operates in practice. So um, under STV voters, when you go to the polls in Northern Ireland are asked to rank candidates in order of preference. Um, so write a one beside uh, your favorite, um, two second favorite, and you can write as many numbers as you want as are on the ballot um, or as few numbers as you want. In counting, a quota is calculated for each constituency. There are 18 constituencies and there are five seats in each, so 90 MLAs in total, members of the Legislative Assembly. Um, and a quota is calculated for each constituency based on the number of seats available and the number of votes cast. So first preference votes are then counted and any candidates who meet the quota are elected. If a candidate receives more than the quota, those kind of extra votes are transferred to other candidates based on the second preference that's on those ballots. At the same time, the candidate that receives the, the fewest votes um, in that first round of counting is knocked out and their votes, um, kind of their second preference votes, um, go to the candidates that they gave their number twos to. Um, so this process repeats uh, quite a few times, as I'm sure Frey in particular will be um, familiar. It means a long counting process um, and results don't come through quickly. And eventually either five candidates have met the quota based on transfers. Um, so those kind of second, third, fourth, et cetera, votes or um, the others are knocked out. And so there are only five candidates left. So what that means is that less votes are wasted um, and the, the kind of action of the voters, the preferences that they express on those ballots, they can all be really quite significant, particularly when you get into the later stages of counting, and um, which is then that kind of principled idea that um, the makeup of the assembly overall reflects um, a kind of broad sweep of the vote. Um, a potential pitfall just uh, on that for voters or for observers of this sort of election that um, is different to first past the post in particular is that while first preference vote, so the kind of vote share that's reported, um, that's based on the first preference votes given to candidates, which is really important. And of course, in this, Sinn Féin got the largest number, but that isn't the whole of the vote um, because those second, third, fourth 
preferences are important. Um, an example in this election is the TUV position, which I'm sure we'll discuss further, but um, they got a real jump in support on first preference votes. Uh, so I think 7.6% of first preference votes went to the TUV, um, but they only returned one candidate, uh, one seat, and that suggests that they got very few um, few of the transferred votes, so the second, third preferences, they didn't do well on. Contrast the Alliance, who got 13.5% of first preference votes, which was a jump for them as well, but they returned 17 seats. And so the kind of, there is a bit of a discrepancy there just because they're very transfer friendly. Um, yeah, hopefully you're... <laughs> well, that's excellent, Lisa. Thanks so much for that. Uh, there does seem to be a question here about how, how well political parties have used this system in the okay. recent election. So we'll come back to that, but thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Michael, you are an expert in trade. So I was hoping you might just be able to give us an overview of why trade is a political issue at present in Northern Ireland and maybe even reflect on how it's changed, broadly speaking, in recent years. Okay, thank you very much, Neve. Um, well, trade and business, because I always like to add the two, are a political issue because, of course, politics and policy is the underpinning of stable and successful trade and business, full stop. So if I take my measure as peace, stability and prosperity as to how trade and business are doing, and if I take the benchmark as, let's just say, 1992 and the creation of the European single market, when the lowest percentage of trade between across any border within the then EEC was between the two jurisdictions on this island, and when neither economy had distinguished itself, particularly during the 1980s. Okay, if you take that and you fast forward to today, and I'll start with the ultimate figure, demographics. So yesterday, NISRA announced that Northern Ireland has its highest population ever, 1.9 million. It's expected that CSO, when its uh, census is completed, will announce 5 million in the Republic. That's an island population of 7 million. That will be the highest by di distance since the 1845 pre-famine figure of 8 million. Okay. Second, the, the Republic's economy has grown by approximately 125% since 2015. You can argue over GDP, GNI measures, etc., but it's astonishing and astounding growth rate and it is being sustained in the face of COVID and other challenges. Northern Ireland is near full employment for the first time possibly in, I won't say ever because I don't, data, I don't have data going back to 1921, but certainly it's a record number of people who are employed. There are again issues of those who are not employed, who are on social welfare, et cetera, but in terms of those in the market for employment, it's at a record high. North-South trade and business has recorded extraordinary growth since 2020 and the putting in the place the protocol. I have said a number of times that 20, maybe 2021 is between 50 and 60% both ways. And in the first quarter, the CSO reports that it's continuing that trend. If any cross-border trade had decreased to that extent anywhere else in the world, everyone would be wondering, my goodness, what is going on? Okay. Now, and finally, I suppose there are issues, of course, with certain sectors and certain areas of activity, especially GBNI, retail activities. However, all of the conversations I have with business people are that they are getting on and managing. It. And those who are in the, how shall I say, are benefiting from the protocol, from the stability that it is providing in order to continue to do your business, to invest in the possibilities of that business. I was thinking of a term, shall we say the silent majority is doing very nicely, thank you. Great, that's really helpful, Michael. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll definitely come back to talking about trade and maybe even not the so-called silent majority if we look at opinion polls and under other pieces of evidence that no doubt you'll talk about yourself. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you for putting us on the same page. And now we're gonna to go to our, our five minute interventions. And I asked each of our panelists to reflect on three themes in relation to their own areas of expertise. One about political parties, secondly about governments, UK, Republic of Ireland, possibly Brussels and three to do with futures, right? broadly conceived. So um, I think we decided that Lisa would go first, followed by Michael and then Freya. So Lisa, over to you on your five to seven minutes starts now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I may run short, we'll see. Uh, and actually, as you remind me of those themes, um, what I thought I would do would give kind of three takeaways um, from the election um, and they focus first on political parties, but I would suggest that 
all three of them raise questions around governance and futures. Um, so hopefully we can go with it and I'm sure we'll pick up on some of the issues in, in questions and discussion. Um, so three takeaways from the election, most prominently, um, Sinn Féin being returned as the largest party, achieving 27 seats in the Assembly. Um, that's no change in their total seats from 2017. Um, and there was uh, an increase in their first preference vote share. Um, but that overall positive result for Sinn Féin um, comes through in part uh, because of the per election um, result day for smaller nationalist party SDLP. Um, that returned eight seats, a loss of four. Um, and that's understood to reflect by some in particular um, a kind of nationalist electorate reaction and consolidation of the nationalist vote behind Sinn Féin um, because of the uh, anticipated DUP unwillingness to enter an executive with Sinn Féin um, was being projected to be the first minister um, based on polling. The political symbolism of Sinn Féin being the largest party um, in the new assembly is kind of difficult to overstate. It's, it's seismic um, and the first time in over 100 years of history that a nationalist party has gained the most support from the electorate here in Northern Ireland. Um, while under the commitments of the 1998 Belfast Friday Agreement, and the institutions that established and partnering institutions that Frey articulated um, so well, um, this kind of result has been possible for the last 24 years, but this is the first time that a possibility has been realised. Um, that has sparked a kind of refocus um, for some around the prospect of Irish unity and the ideas around Irish unity. Um, I think it's important to kind of temper that in a sense, and I'm sure we can come on to discuss this in more detail, um, but that there isn't actually any direct link between um, Sinn Féin being first minister and having the largest, being the largest party and the prospects of Irish unification in terms of process or procedure. That's not to take away from the symbolism um, that's important there. Happy to talk further on that one. Second key takeaway um, and the kind of other half of the explanation for Sinn Féin being, um, having a really positive result is that we saw a splitting of the unionist vote um, to the detriment of primarily the DUP returning 25 seats, a loss of three, um, but also the UUP uh, who returned nine seats and um, a loss of one. Um, and then a corresponding growth um, already sort of touched upon in support for the TUV, which are the traditional unionist voiced um, and quite a hardline unionist party. Uh, as mentioned, they had a real jump in first preference vote share, um, but only one seat. I think it's worth underlining that supporters for the TV in particular, but also the DUP um, are very strongly opposed to the protocol. Um, and that feeds into that is linked to the um, collapse of the executive and the situation we're now in, um, in terms of uh, stagnation and stalemate. Um, so fragmentation of the unionist vote um, presents not only a challenge for political unionism here in Northern Ireland, but also because of the, the protocol kind of situation and the position of the DUP prior to the election in terms of collapse in the assembly, um, it also raises questions for the UK government and its position in respect to the protocol, because principally that splitting of the vote and the, the challenge facing political unionism is explained by intra-unionist frictions and tensions over the protocol and their positions on that. Um, and that's partly why I think uh, part of the explanation for events and developments we've seen post-election um, in the UK government's action, proposed action um, around uh, taking, uh, making unilateral legislative change um, to disapply parts of the protocol. Again, that's like an issue of governance and future uh, that we can maybe discuss further. Um, third takeaway that I wanted to flag, again already mentioned, is the increase in support for the non-aligned Alliance Party, um, who added nine seats um, and jump in vote share. Uh, so returning 17 MLAs in total, um, almost, uh, so like a 40-40-20 split almost, um, in terms of designation in the Assembly. These are their best ever results. Um, and while an increase in support for Alliance wasn't unexpected based on um, polling, etc., 
the strength of showing is really quite significant. Um, and the fact that this wasn't um, this kind of surge in the language that's used in support for alliance um, is consistent with the three results that we saw in 2019 elections held here, um, which is just to, to underline that it doesn't seem to be a kind of protest vote or um, specific to this current political moment, but that this is now an established trend. Um, and in the Northern Ireland context, growth and support for alliance, because they are um, non-aligned, uh, raises really important questions about governance and the governance structures here, because um, essentially power sharing arrangements for devolution and devolved government is premised on an idea and understanding that Northern Ireland is deeply divided between the two blocks, two communities, unionist and nationalist. And while that may have been um, the case um, broadly in 1998, these election results suggest, maybe even just affirm, um, that that's no longer the demographic um, nor the electoral and political kind of reality. Um, and so that raises questions that I would expect to come to the fore even more if and when we do get an assembly um, in operation. Uh, to close, and I'm really not sure how I'm doing on time, uh, but just a brief word on developments since the election, particularly the UK government's announcement uh, to pass legislation to facilitate unilateral disapplication of parts of the protocol. Um, while UK ministers and the UK government have also requested that the DP reverse their position and enter into um, an executive facilitate a speaker to be elected. Uh, the government also in statements and UK ministers cite the absence of devolved government here as part of their justification for the, um, how can I say it diplomatically, unconventional approach uh, to treaty implementation and treaty negotiations. Um, Liz Truss, uh, the Foreign Secretary uh, writing the Irish Times um, today, cited the protocol as the biggest obstacle to devolved government. Um, so kind of almost just leaving aside uh, the validity or otherwise of the UK government's position in that, um, I think what it shows is the, the important and newly central position and status of Northern Ireland in the post-Brexit context, not just within the UK, but in UKE relations. Um, so that in itself, I think, is quite a quite a historic shift. Um, since it was established, Northern Ireland has been the kind of a place apart. It's been a, a frontier place, a peripheral place. Um, but today, the stability in Northern Ireland and the functioning of government and operation of government here is really kind of like the, the fulcrum. It's the connection point between the UK and the EU legal orders, um, but also at the moment politically. Um, and that for a place still um, still attempting to process its peace is really challenging. Um, I'll finish there. Brilliant. Please, thank you very much. She raised lots of interesting questions, so I look forward to discussing those. Um, and you did really well on time. Thank you very much. Michael, over, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to play the, uh, <laughs> the age card. <laughs> And what I mean by that is, Lisa was saying how Northern Ireland suddenly finds itself at the center of world attention in a way now. Well, actually, for those of us old enough to remember the troubles, Northern Ireland was always at the center of attention. As a traveler from this island, if you went anywhere and met anybody, the first thing they asked you was about the troubles in Northern Ireland. And they asked for an explanation. Of why were people, particularly Protestants and Catholics, killing each other? And it was relentless and incessant and embarrassing and difficult. And in a way, in that personal experience spilt over into business and business people from this island trying to get to set to sell their products, engage in joint ventures, and in particular attract investment. And that really made it difficult. And that's one of the keys going back to my point about the measure being the Good Friday Agreement bringing stability and bringing peace, which is the essence of that stability creating the possibility for the prosperity that both parts of the island have achieved since through a very difficult period in the world economy. Don't forget, we've had the Great Recession in the middle of that time, the worst since 1928. We've just been hit by a pandemic, the first, some would argue, since the Middle Ages. 
So, I mean, imagine, again, the counterfactual. Imagine, A, we still had an unsettled and violent problem on the island, number one. Or number two, we didn't have a protocol which was consolidating the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, And in particular, as someone who's been driving to Belfast for the first time since the pandemic, and the volume of traffic, I can tell you, is at record levels in my experience for 30 years of both freight and individual movements. Right. And it's a real mix of northern registrations coming south and southern registrations going north. As I commented at a meeting yesterday, there was a time if you spotted another southern registration, you almost waved and says, I bet you're going to the same meeting as me. It was such a rare event. So I want to, there's another fact. So I want to lift that to the geopolitical level, right from the personal level. Again, the US interest, I'm really curious as to why the UK media and the UK government is paying so little attention to the US's government. Why it seems to be so dismissive of this as some Irish American con job that's based on politics and history and culture or something like that. I mean, we've had a, a bipartisan mission. Just think about that. An American political bipartisan mission to Ireland and London and Brussels. And I think today they're in Northern Ireland. And their sole message is don't mess with the Good Friday Agreement because it's our agreement. Now, why is that? I'll tell you, my insight is I was very fortunate to be at President Clinton's investment conference in 1994 or 95, I think, in the wake of the ceasefires. And again, I went over thinking it was all about Irish America and politics, et cetera. But I realized listening to the Clinton and his cabinet, no, it was strategic for America. At that time, the Berlin Wall had just come down and they saw this new integrated world economy. And within that economy, the risk was from places within it that there was ongoing violence. Northern Ireland, the Balkans and the Middle East. Of those three 20th century American peace projects, by far the most successful is the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland one. And in the wake of seeing large scale political violence take, breaking out again in Ukraine with the illegal invasion, the breaking of international agreements by Russia, they can see there are elements of the Good Friday Agreement process which have relevance to how the whole scenario in Ukraine is gonna to have to be managed. But what they find is that their ally is messing around with the agreement, frankly, right? And is creating trouble when many would argue it's unnecessary. So I really find this extraordinary, to be honest, that, that this, this, this approach that the UK government is taking. Likewise with the EU, again, the British government's view is again articulated by Liz Trust this morning in the Irish Times that Freya mentioned is that they wish to see the EU, the EU member states give the commission a new mandate. Well, it's very clear, the protocol is the Commission's mandate, full stop. There isn't going to be another protocol, even the government accept that. So what is going on, right? There is a process set out in the protocol for managing issues as they arise. Anyone who's dealt with the Commission over 30 years knows the Commission is an evolving and the EU an evolving process, right? But there's a way to go about it. And all those elements are built in to the protocol and they're based on law, the Aki. And they're based on consultation, this joint committee, the specialized committee, the joint working group. All of those elements are built in and the connectivity is there to the Good Friday Agreement because the North South Ministerial Council and the cross-border bodies can participate in that process. So there you have a direct link between the two elements, the GFA and the protocol. Again, it's not being worked. It's not being worked properly and it's not being worked effectively. Instead, we're being continually thrown into crisis after crisis after crisis. So from an EU perspective, they have basically, you know, they wish to proceed here, but there it's very, very difficult to do so. And I think, again, what doesn't get enough attention is to management, the management of the actual flow of the goods and the movement of goods. Again, the, the commission is very concerned that the British government has not put in the practical operational requirements to do that effectively. Leave aside how much data. Leave aside how many forms, and it's nowhere near as many as some people claim. There's the issue of how is the EU going to know by having access to whatever data it is agreed that there is no risk to the integrity of the single market, because only access to data will tell them that in order to make a risk assessment. And the other thing that the Commission is, is just, I think, can't understand is why there's this continuing conflating of veterinary issues with the wider issue of goods movement. 
The wider issue of good movement is a protection of integrity of tax systems, of brands, etc. But veterinary is about protecting people and lives and the risk to public health. And that's universal. One life, one packet, one, one, one hamburger that poisons someone is a risk. So again, these, these issues, and I don't, you know, these issues are not in a sense, the commission has just not being taken seriously. They're being avoided and not being tackled. And I suppose the risk for a business point of view is that political decisions therefore are undermining the positive position and po opportunities that the protocol has put in place. We've heard nothing about Article 11 in the protocol. That's all about protecting North-South cooperation and energy, the whole idea of a single energy market, the all-island labor market, agri-food, tourism, I could go on, higher education, they're all in there. You hear nothing about any of those elements that are part and parcel of the total package, the totality of the protocol, again, picking up that key word in the Good Friday Agreement that was to manage the totality of relationships, okay? Again, all of that is not being tackled, we're being kept brought into other areas of, of, con of contest, really, that's the only way I can describe it, it's a contest, not a joint bilateral cooperative management process between the two governments with the support of the EU and the US government. That's the essence of the Good Friday Agreement. That's the signal business took that you were going to have a fundamental security of a framework that business cooperate. Yes, the rules would be changed and evolved, but fundamentally you're going to have a solid framework as we've had since 1998 to continue forward. And that enabled you to deal with the wider challenges that the current that the world economy is turning up we're heading into a recession energy prices we all know them and yet again energy effort of both governments has been consumed by this ongoing interaction at a political level around the protocol you know and i just think picking up lisa's very good uh, analysis there of the election you know political decisions of consequences and, you know, if a political party, despite the mandate that they got from their electorate, decide to pass by those opportunities, you know, there, there has to be consequences. But wor what worries me most of all, however, is that the GFA's totality of relationships, which absolutely is based on the premise of a devolved administration in Northern Ireland, deep interaction on the island of Ireland, cooperation between the British and Irish governments with the EU and the US, giving full strategic, financial and other supports all of that's being put into play by the way the British government at the moment is approaching the protocol. Great, Michael, thanks very much for that. Lots of food for thought there, um, lots of interesting questions raised. Uh, Freya, I'm gonna hand over to you for your, for your um, seven minute intervention. You, you can keep an eye on the time. Um, and Eve, th thank you. Um, and um, I think a lot of what I'm going to say has, has sort of already been um, reflected by Lisa in her really excellent um, piece and, and by, by Michael as well. Um, but um, what I thought I would do, um, and apologies to anybody who's read this in the Irish Times previously, but when we're thinking about um, elections and about the future, I wrote um, a piece I, th I think it was the day after the election kind of finished and it was sort of looking ahead to, 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 to all of these future questions um, and it was sort of framed around the election created answers, but it actually created more questions. So I'm going to paraphrase a bit of that. So apologies, you're obviously all avid Irish Times readers, so we'll know it intimately. Um, but um, it, it's actually, it's funny, it's a piece I've sort of looked back on since, and it's a really good guide kind of some of these issues. So I suppose in terms of answers um, that we got from the election, and, and Lisa touched on, on, on some of these, um, I mean, really clear cut answer in terms of Sinn Féin, you know, really resounding endorsement at the ballot box, more than 250,000 first preference votes votes, largest party, you know, and again, that significance of having a nationalist entitled to hold that um, position of a first minister for the first time ever, it is really, really significant in, in when you think of Northern Ireland in the context of a state that was set up a, a hundred years ago, essentially to be a unionist dominated state. And, and, and some, some of the some of what we saw that led to the civil rights movement in terms of the gerrymandering. So, I mean, a hugely important symbolism um, there, aside from anything else. Um, Answers um, also in terms of the question of whether Northern Ireland is beginning to move beyond this traditional orange and green allegiance, which on the one hand, the success of Sinn Féin might indicate other uh, or might indicate otherwise. But the fact that, you know, we had the non-aligned Alliance Party do so well, more than double its vote. And, and Lisa's right, this has been a trend since 2019. There were three elections in, in 2019 that were really breakthrough for the Alliance Party. 
um, the, now the third largest party, and this raises huge questions about just simply the way in which the structures of the, of the assembly are set up, and this assumption, if you like, that that everything is predicated on unionist and, and nationalist, and we now have approaching twenty percent. If you take in the other much smaller non-aligned parties. Um, who don't define themselves in, in that way. So, so that's something that's going to have to be looked at. And certainly the success of Alliance has given, ha, has given real um, fuel um, to their campaign um, in that way, if you like. Um, you can argue that there was an answer of sorts to where unionism stands on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And though you know, we've talked about the DUP's percentage vote share declined um, quite significantly, um, fell by just under 7%, it only lost three seats, in part due to vote management, in part because it had a bit of a cushion in some constituencies. But it did retain its largest its position as the largest unionist party. Um, and the DUP certainly would argue that that's an endorsement of its stance on the pro protocol and the action that, that it has taken. Um, although, again, if you go into the questions about what people want in terms of the, the assembly, the overwhelming majority in Northern Ireland want an assembly back up and functioning and they want politicians back in. But nevertheless, you know, there is this um, approaching 30 percent effectively if you take in DUP voters and, and TUV voters, you know, who are deeply opposed to protocol. And, and, and that is going to have to be addressed in some shape or form. I would argue that the solutions aren't actually all around what what is it um, Liz Truss said today fixing not scrapping it's not all around that but it's it, it's it, it, addressing those questions of identity and how, how um, unionism feels its identity is, has has been undermined by this um so there's something that's going to be have to have to be looked at um again in terms of answers bit of an opaque sort of answer um on the question of the border poll and this was something that was played down by Sinn Féin during the campaign um but then Mary Lou Macdonald came out straight after um, and talked about um, how she believed a vote would happen in the next five years, that it's sometimes sort of cited as, as 10 years. Um, the reality is, and we'll probably touch on this, but, you know, a border poll isn't going to happen at any time soon, um, not least because it's up to the British Secretary of State to, to call this. So, I mean, Lisa was absolutely right. Sinn Féin in, in the positions of the largest party does not mean there's going to be a border poll tomorrow, but inevitably it would, would give sucker and, and and give encouragement to those who would who would campaign for that um the questions um far more questions than answers i mean obviously the big one at the minute is about what happens with the assembly and with the executive and and, and the reformation of this um i mean this has been linked uh, obviously really firmly by the dup to the question of the protocol and there was all this sort of speculation as to whether the the, the UK government's announcement that they're going to legislate to effectively scrap parts of the protocol might give the DUP a way back. Um, it, it, it may do. Um, I mean, the, there was a, an interesting sort of softening of language of the DUP after that in, in that the, they said, look, we need to wait and see the detail of the legislation. And, and to be honest, that's what everybody says um, in, in regard to dealings with the UK government at, at, at the minute. I mean, the DUP will not believe anything until they see it written down in, in front of them and preferably until, until it happens. Um, and I think everybody would agree that they're quite right to be, to be wary, but th there was sort of a door open potentially, if you like, that maybe if this is deemed satisfactory, then it might open the way to at least appointing a speaker and then you can at least have an assembly. There's still the question of the executive and the first deputy first minister to be sorted out, but it, it wouldn't be the, the sort of entire collapse or practically entire collapse that we have at, at the minute. Um, whether that actually will happen or not, I, I don't know, not least because experience tells us, and I said this earlier, once you get into these situations in Northern Ireland, it can, it can be really hard to, to get out of them and set them back up again. And also because, you know, other parties, other interests will have their own asks. You know, it, it's not realistic um, to hold the Assembly to ransom, if you like, um, as certainly Alliance and, the, and Sinn Féin have put it. And then just say, actually, it, we're fine, we're sorted, let's all go back in. You know, other parties will have their own asks there. Um, I think in terms of other um, questions, I'm probably going way over time here. I'll try and, try and uh, rattle through. Um, you know, the, the other big difficulty with the problem, with, with all this being kind of harness the protocol, if you like, this is not something that is in the DUP's gift to deliver. This is down to the EU and the UK government. Um, you know, certainly another question for the future is about... Uh, the UK government's relations really with everybody in this. I mean, I mean, certainly there has been a worsening of relations with, with, with the Irish government. I mean, 
privately and sort of official level, they would say that relations there are still very good. But, you know, the 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 sheer amount of unilateral moves taken or, or, or signposted by the British government and the action on legacy um, is another one, you know, that's hugely, hugely divisive. You know, this has all been re- really damaging. There's also these broader questions about the way the, the assembly functions now in, in the view of what's happened in the view of the increased vote for alliance. There's questions for political parties. I mean, not least the DUP because their vote share declined so much. What happens for them next? You know, I mean, that, that's not really the focus at the minute, but there are questions, there are questions there for the other smaller parties, the SDLP and the UUP. Um, but I mean, the, to, to sort of revert back and to con- conclude, um, you know, we, we have this impasse at the minute. Um, I don't think anybody can really see a quick way out of this. And we have this, in theory, we do have a deadline, um, 24 weeks, which is sort of, I think, mid-November. Uh, if this isn't resolved, the entire the assembly collapses entirely. So there, there aren't even the caretaker ministers. Secretary of State then has to call an election, which is held within 12 weeks. Now, we've seen before, again, that there has been this compulsion to call an election and it doesn't happen. Um, there's a school of thought that maybe says, you know, certain um, people would quite like an election. I actually don't see what an election would would solve. Um, so, yeah, and we're looking at potentially a long period of limbo. And fundamentally, that doesn't really do people in Northern Ireland any good who the vast majority say, you know, they, they want an assembly up and running and they want government working. Brilliant. Freya, thanks, thanks very much again. Loads of questions and um, gosh, well, there's not a time for them all, but I look forward to asking some of them anyway. So let's start with the P word. And uh, by that, I don't mean parties, the Downing Street version. I had to get it in there um, because of the day that it is. Instead, I mean the protocol, which often is called the Northern Ireland Protocol. And you've all sort of flying like this is clearly a problem, right? This is or a problem, maybe manufactured, maybe real. I mean, let's discuss what you think about that. But we've heard different arguments put forward by different people. I mean, Liz Truss has said that it's damaging trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and therefore the protocol is directly related to the fact that Stormont isn't sitting. So that's sort of her viewpoint today in her opinion piece. Johnson is saying that, you know, Northern Ireland responds on or operates across community support, and the protocol damages that, and therefore it's destructive to the peace process in, in Northern Ireland. So I was wondering what your views are. I mean, to what extent is the protocol actually furthering politi- political instability in Northern Ireland? Or do you have other views on that? Um, Freya, I'll jump to you first of all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose um, undoubtedly it, it, it is furthering political instability, but I would argue actually that, that Brexit um, in general um, has created political instability and this is this is is just sort of a more recent outworking of, of this um I mean oh god there, there's there's so much in that um I mean in 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 terms of so so there's almost kind of been this narrative I think if you like es- established um it, that the protocol is harming Northern Ireland that it is causing economic harm to, to to Northern Ireland um and this is it particularly reflected, I have to say, in sort of the the, the British media, um, and in, in part this comes from the fact. I mean, the, for for a huge amount of time, there was nobody. Um, there, there were only um, DUP MPs d- discussing this in in Westminster, and then the, the, and so it's partly that, and it's partly also this is what's being put across by by the British government. Um, I mean, this is plantation. Everybody accepts that. Um, but you talk to to business, um, and they they are quite clear that there there are huge opportunities. Um, but actually, what business really wants is they they just want the issues dealt with. They want them dealt with in a practical way. And a thing that was really stark from from me the um, the, the 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 evening that the, the the DUP resigned from the executive or resigned as first minister in, in February, and the DUP leader Jeffrey Donaldson sort of give, give, give a spoke to reporters outside the hotel where this was all happening, and he talked about you know this is causing economic harm to the protocol. You know we have to take out, we have to do something about this, uh, and the the Belfast. Um, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which you represent about um, twelve hundred businesses, um, said exactly the opposite. And and they said, look, we are re- we want stability. We need an exact. You know, we 
we, we, we need this this is not is not what we want you know so the two things both can't can't be be right and and you know obviously if you the particular sectors you talk to I mean things like people who um import pedigree farm animals for sort of breeding between Northern Ireland and Scotland huge problems for, for them um you know for for your average um businesses that mainly export to um, britain for example you know absolutely no problem no, no issue so um yeah i think this this narrative has been established but i think it's also because it it has become politicized and it, it's really it's really important to remember that in in january um 2021 when the protocol came into effect the dup initially was advocating for the for the benefits of this you know there was an argument made about about the benefits of this um and it was only really there was an opinion poll that came out that that February um which reflected a big jump in starts um that this this narrative sort of began to change so so um I would argue that that some of this has also come from um internal difficulties um and, and that internal kind of fracturing about how unionism deals with deals with the protocol um and, and it, it is it, it has become it, it's become about about this much wider constitutional issue um about this issue of of consent i mean about all of these really kind of thorny issues um and i think again and i'll sort of try and round round it off with this i mean a thing that that really struck me again mara sefkovich um heard evidence virtually from a, a Stormont committee in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, people talked about the issues and the difficulties around the protocol. And um, w- when it came to um, some of the representatives who, who were putting forward this, this argument and they were saying, you know, this damages our place in the United Kingdom. And you could almost see his amusement because he kept saying things like, well, you know, I understand what you're saying to me, but this isn't an, an international agreement about trade. You know, this doesn't impact on the constitutional position of the United Kingdom. Um, and 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 he kept on repeating, you know, very politely and very, you know, but he just sort of kept kept repeating this. Um, and I, I think that that's something that's not really understood, perhaps from from the UK side either. That actually this it, it, it is it has come to be seen in this way by by a section of unionism. Um, and this is something that's going to have to be addressed. But ultimately, this is something about trade. And and a majority of people in Northern Ireland, well, Northern Ireland didn't vote for Brexit. They don't support the protocol per se, but they support it as the least worst option. Um, and the call from businesses and so on would be about it. it, it it's, it's about stability and it's about progress. It's about knowing what the rules are and, and getting on with it. I hope that answered your question because I've been all over the place there. But no, I think it Excellent, Brenda. Thank you. I think Barry told me if it's a bit noisy outside, it'd be all the students not studying for exams or creating noise out there. Um, anyway, never mind. That's a separate separate topic. Lisa, I was wondering, um, I mean, you've mentioned a few things about the split of the unionist vote, for example, um, which implies maybe our, our audience aren't so familiar with that, that unionism needs to consolidate around sort of unionism as, as a sort of own distinct entity, and there's no fragmentation within it. But what we've seen over recent years is fragmentation, but, well, first of all, from the UUP through to the DUP, but now from the DUP to the TUV, and then arguably through to the Alliance as well. So unionism as a sort of entity is no longer um, is no longer holding all of these groups right, who are expressing diverse interests. Um, in terms of the protocol, however, there does seem to be slightly more unity in terms of all of these groups, and maybe not the Alliance, having different opinions of the protocol and thinking that actually isn't working, which is contrary to what the businesses and other institutions are saying. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that um, in relation to the, the, the political parties. Yeah, sure. Um, and could probably, I guess it's kind of a supplement to what Freya's outlined um, really well. And there are so many issues in relation to this. Um, I would say for, for unionism, um, again, it's, it's important to distinguish between in terms of talking about the protocol's effect there is the practical effect and the practical implications and that's the kind of business strand and um kind of felt experience on the ground but then there's the political effect um, and that's that political kind of collection of issues around the politics and the constitutional implications of the protocol that's um what you see kind of unity and very um, often vociferous opposition um, to in political unionism here. 
Um, that distinction is important, I think, because when you look at the UK government's position on the protocol, although their rhetoric is, is harsh and um, as discussed, their um, tendency towards the unilateral um, is uh, unconventional and um, it, uh, problematic. Um, they aren't talking about scrapping the protocol on the basis of its constitutional implications. That's the unionist and Northern Ireland unionist kind of unifying um, issue and position. So how that plays out if we do see some um, easements or some agreement on uh, the protocol and the way it operates on the practical concerns, um, that's not going to get to the heart of the political unionism's opposition to it here. Um, and that does put, um, it puts the UK government in a bit of a bind, um, but it also raises some existential questions um, for uh, those political unionism here. Um, I do think it's maybe worth highlighting that we've seen a, a bit of a change um, in the language of uh, the DUP, um, although I wouldn't overstate this, uh, away from removing the protocol to removing the Irish sea border. Um, so that is in particular on those checks. And I do think if there was an agreement that really eased um, checks on certain goods, uh, so it would probably um, an expansion of the at-risk um, definition that there currently is and the assumption of risk under the protocol and also um, the trusted trader scheme. So that would just ease for those businesses um, that do exist here that have really been affected because they're so reliant on GBNI movement of goods. Um, and of course that they are not the majority, that business community in general are pretty pro the protocol, um, although they're also pro easements. Uh, if those were fixed, we, we might start to see the DUP in particular, but unionism kind of moving towards a, a more cell position. Um, maybe that's over optimistic. Uh, the constitutional questions just to touch on in terms of its interaction with the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, because I think it's important to make clear that some of the language around what the protocol has or hasn't done to the 1998 agreement um, doesn't reflect the, the text of the 1998 agreement. So the idea that it's undermined um, provisions there for consent and the principle of consent in the 1998 agreement, consent is pretty clearly defined um, and there's a principle for uh, majority popular consent to any change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland from within the UK to um, a unification with Ireland in a referendum held for those purposes. And that's um, written pretty vaguely in the 1998 agreement, but it's defined in UK law and has been defined in UK courts and that that's what that principle is about. And then the cross community consent principle, which is the one that's been brought to the fore around um, lack of cross community consent for the protocol, etc., cetera, um, is only in relation to devolved Northern Ireland issues and only issues in the assembly that Freya mentioned at the beginning that are deemed as requiring cross community consent because they're cross cutting or controversial. So the key is UK international relations and international treaties are not devolved issues. And so the protocol is, is not a, an issue that requires cross-community consent, just as the Brexit referendum outcome wasn't an issue that required cross-community consent. And if you play out the principle of the argument that's made by DUP and unionism on this issue, it would mean that we would require cross-community consent in the Northern Ireland devolved assembly for the signing of an agreement between um, New Zealand and the UK every international treaty you know it's it there is a discrepancy there um the other thing is just on east west and after this i'll stop talking because i could clearly talk for too long on this um but the the discussion around east west tends to um kind of suffer from a bit of a, a conceptual slippage in the 1998 agreement east west is intergovernmental relations between britain and ireland the two governments and between 
the um, devolved regions to the British Irish Council, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland, um, and the Crown Dependencies. That's what East West relates to. The idea that East West is GBNI, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, that is not in the 1998 agreement and is itself, I would argue, a bit problematic for unionism um, to portray that in that way because Northern Ireland is fully part of the UK state. Um, so those are some of the issues. I realise I didn't give any kind of solution <laughs> for those issues. But, um, no worries, Lisa. I'm delighted you mentioned those things. Um, I mean, you've highlighted here crafty political rhetoric, we sort of thinking this idea of consent and, and talking about it in a different way. That's outside of the parameters of the Good Friday Agreement. And also you've highlighted strand three of the Good Friday Agreement. I had a read of it earlier on today, trying to figure out what exactly is going on here in relation to the agreement and in relation to the rhetoric. And again, you know, strand three about East-West relations is about the British Irish Council, which is a Republic of Ireland institution in relation to uh, the rest of Britain, not Northern Ireland and the rest of Britain. So it's quite interesting how these concepts are being deployed and also being repeated by the media, I'm not throwing Frey into the limelight here, but I will ask her some questions about the media later on, uh, without really much scrutiny. So that's really interesting. Um, Michael, before we move on to your views in the Good Friday Agreement, let's talk about the protocol in relation to trade. You highlighted quite a few things. I think you, in fact, mentioned that uh, many of the problems from the protocol are stemming from Britain, not actually implementing checks, documentation on its side. And there were some of the, the problems between Northern Ireland and Britain are arising, but they're being blamed in the protocol as a whole and craftily being, um, being targeted towards the EU. I'm wondering what your views are on that, if you might tell us a bit about the protocol in relation to trade. So, well, I suppose I'll double down basically on my theme that the protocol is designed to provide stability for trade and business. And overall, that's exactly what it's doing. And what's happening by, as a consequence of the political debate, it's injecting a sense of instability to it and to the process, as I outlined, which is built into the protocol to deal with these issues as they arise. And it's getting in the way of the process doing what it's meant to do, frankly, right across the pro right across the whole totality of the protocol. It hasn't even touched on, forgive my clock in the background. <laughs> That's not a free bird outside the window. I meant to, meant to stop that. Um, what, what we haven't even mentioned is the common travel area, Article 2 and 3 of the protocol, which is essential to underpin movement on the island. Because it's not just about, I, I get a bit frustrated about the trade piece. I mean, the totality of the protocol and its relationships, the totality of human relationships for work, for working, for communities, for traveling, you know, between places and people, for buying services on the other side of the border when it happens to be a mile away, right? Or even 10 miles away. And how much more important that is now that we're in this era of remote working, right? Where you could work anywhere on the island, really, and travel to an employer anywhere else on the island easier than getting on a train or, a, or you know a plane or a boat arguably in many instances so it's just i think again the effect of the political argument has been to you know narrow it down to far too limited uh, a conversation about far too small a dimension of that totality right i mean if you stand back for objective evidence even for, you know from a uk source again very little attention was given to the report that NISER, the National Economic and Social Research, issued there recently. You know, and they are the people who do regional economic modeling within the UK and showing how Northern Ireland was doing better than other UK regions. And how they, while they couldn't come to a conclusion yet, it indicated to them that the protocol had something to do with this because it left that part of the UK with the stability provided to the protocol compared to the you know, the free flowing Brexit, which is all about opportunities that have yet to be outlined, etc. And I'm sure they will they will come definitely, you know, for the UK as it develops into its new a new scenario. So, I mean, I suppose that's the objective macro evidence, the anecdotal evidence, as I say, if you look at just, you know, lived experience of anybody in Northern Ireland who's traveling the roads to Dublin or Derry or to Donegal or Enniskillen, you know, to Monaghan. Right. And the fact that there is no change. I mean, I was just thinking about this. Imagine if all the people who came, all the international media that came to look at the local elections were all able to drive down the A1 to the border and film, you know, line after line of truck, much bigger than would have been in Dover, plus cars, plus people all held up. Right. Imagine 
how, what would that have done for peace and stability and the sense of the island and its sort of international reputation and the international brand that the Good Friday Agreement has given the island in terms of a place to go to, to move freely around, to have full, enjoy the full experience of a Game of Thrones, golf, you name it, the Titanic, etc. So I just think, again, I'm sorry, I'm maybe not answering your question directly, but I'm trying to answer the question that no one else is posing, <laughs> which is the benefits of the stability as distinct from the issues, which there are there, of course. I don't for a moment say there aren't issues, but there's definitely a very big difference between the private conversations you have with people about those issues and the public narrative that's been engaged in and driven by the political the political process, you know, and again, just to share a sort of conversations, one, one's ultimate source of stability or instability are bankers. Well, my conversations with bankers suggest that until very recently, everything was fine. Businesses were still looking for overdrafts, still looking for loans. I mean, in the context of the wider economic issues, right? I mean, with, you know, we can't ignore them. They're an additional pressure. But actually, in the last couple of months, there have been a couple of suggestions. People are, well, what about the protocol? Again, because of the political narrative. But it's only been in the last couple of months with this last big push by the DUP, you know, right, to highlight the issue and to make it, a, you know, not go back into the executive, um, so to speak. So right. I think that's really, really important to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, Michael. I think that comes across. And I, I'm glad you brought up this issue of narrative, because I think it's very closely related to how the Good Friday Agreement has been used in recent rhetoric by lots of different actors. So I have my own views on how it's been used, but I just want to throw it up to the, to the panel and go to Freya, first of all. I mean, Freya, the Good Friday Agreement has been said, mentioned a lot in recent weeks, more in recent weeks than it's been mentioned in recent years, yeah? Um, and it's been used in very creative ways. So I'm just wondering what you've noticed with your savvy media eye in terms of how it's been used by various actors and what your, what your thoughts are about that. Well, uh, savvy media eye, so uh, no, no pressure there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 interesting, isn't it, that, that I suppose invoking the Good Friday Agreement and sort of the need to protect it um, on the one hand and, and the damage that is sort of being, being done to it on the other has kind of become um, the, the thing to do. You know, I mean, I, I can't remember um, the last time that it was, it was kind of talked about it as much. And, and I suppose in, in one in one way, you can argue it, it 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 demonstrates the fundamental position that the Good Friday. I mean, I mean, it, it is the the bedrock. I mean, in terms of what Michael was saying about stability, is it, it it is the, the bedrock. Um, and I suppose, I mean, if if you um look at even one of the things that that was happening today, um, the the U.S. um delegation um is in just arrived in Northern Ireland this morning. They've been doing the tour, tour sort of, of um, they were in England and then they were in Dublin and they're up in the North and they were, they were here in, in Derry today, which is where I am at the moment. And, and um, uh, Congressman Richie Neal was talking about, you know, he, he was making that comparison between what we have now compared to what was dealt with and, and, and what was resolved, you know, nearly 25 years ago. And, and I mean, there is absolutely no comparison in terms of stability, in terms of kind of a, a, everything else. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it, it all comes down to narratives. It all comes down to kind of political narratives. Um, and and I, I think it I think it actually feeds into a wider um, conversation about um, how news is reported, where we get our news, the influence of, of, of social media, because um, uh, we, you know, we've seen this sort of increasingly in re recent years that it becomes about the narrative rather than about necessarily what 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 actually are the facts. And, and I thought what Lisa said was really interesting about the, East, the that point about East-West relations um, and actually that in theory that should be if you go strictly by the good friday agreement that should be problematic for unionism because it's almost kind of implying that, that they that they aren't part, part of the uk if you if you take east for east west relations kind of, kind of into this um and I, i'm sort of dig digressing slightly here but just in terms of narratives i mean one of the things that i've always found really interesting through all the, the brexit debate and, and the protocol debate has been this insistence that northern ireland the, the insistence by unionism that northern ireland cannot be different from the rest of the UK, that it has to be exactly the same. Northern Ireland has always had different laws from the rest of the UK since, since it was formed. It has always been ruled in, in a different way. There have always been, and this is because, again, I think it was Michael made the point about health, there have always been 
checks on things like live animals coming from from um, Great Britain because it's a different and um, what's that word Epi epidemiological unit that was the COVID phrase but it, it, you know it, it, it's it's a different um, ecosystem and, and even things like I mean we the, one of the things that's being one of the other wrangles here in Northern Ireland at the minute it, it is about abortion and, and the UK government is introducing abortion legislation to bring the position in Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the UK. Um, because this legislation wasn't progressed in in in, in Stormont, so um, and, and the DUP were arguing very vociferously that Northern Ireland is a different case, so this can't happen. And, and I mean, the, the two positions are just kind of directly at odds. But to circle back um, to the Good Friday Agreement in terms of what what we were what we were talking about, um, yeah, I, I think it's about all these things. I think it's about, about narrative. I, I think it's really interesting the way suddenly um, again unionism is sort of pitching its argument to the idea of consent and, and basing that in, in in a premise to do with the Good Friday Agreement that just isn't correct. But again, it, it's almost that as if once these principles and these narratives get embedded, um, those are really difficult to challenge. And I, I don't actually, I don't know how you do challenge that, but I think there's also a broader question that if, you know, if you have a, a, a section of the population that believe they are not being listened to, that they are not being taken seriously, when maybe others are, you know, rightly or wrongly, if that's their perception, then that's something that at some point has to be dealt with as well. And I, to, to sort of reflect on the point that Lisa made, um, e even if the UK government can, some, can somehow fix the trade issues around the protocol, what, what what do you do then about that fact of, of, that, that that there is this whole section um, of of people who feel that their position has been under undermined? You know, so I think those things, whether they're based on a correct premise or not, the things that, that will need to be taken on board. That's probably really rambly, but I hope that's what that means. That's, that that's great, Freya. And can I just can I jump on that last point and just put it to Lisa? I mean, Lisa, what are your thoughts if that happens? <laughs> um tricky <laughs> um I, I do think and I, I guess I would reflect um perhaps more broadly around the nature of the 1998 agreement um and the nature of political process here and progress here in Northern Ireland has always featured since 1998 has always featured what I would um describe as like an implementation gap uh, so we have this kind of rolling process of um, political texts. So then the Belfast Agreement is an international treaty, um, but we've had successor agreements, which are kind of, um, these are like quasi political legal documents. They aren't um, directly, they tend to not be fully or directly implemented. Um, they have to be kind of translated into UK law. And even the 1998 agreement, I mean, not all of its provisions are implemented. And if you read it, it's it's very much a kind of um, treaty language or kind of constitutional language. It's it's principled. It's um, uh, yeah. So it kind of keeps it at a high level. Um, and so what that means and what that kind of gap um, results in a lot of space for narrative and perception. And the kind of use of narrative and um, uh, portrayals that don't have to be totally accurate or can be questionable or can be like half truths, um, and and I think that is a part of the kind of characteristics of Northern Ireland politics, um, and also a power sharing system. I mean, even the fact that we political party manifestos are never implemented here. I mean, just kind of dealing in narrative and dealing in vision that you don't ever have to really realize or implement is kind of almost a feature of um, the system that's set up here. Uh, and all of that, bringing it back to your actual question, um, is that I, and I may be over optimistic in this, but I do think um, there could be a scenario where uh, we see some changes to the protocol um, agreed at UKE level and we start to see a kind of progressive rolling back of the rhetoric on the part of political unionism here out of existential necessity because there isn't, uh, because the UK government pulls rank on this stuff and if they are not giving, if they stop kind of giving quarter 
to the political unionist argument here and don't address those constitutional issues, then for the survival of the parties and political unionism, there's going to have to be a bit of a shift in that narrative. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount that as a scenario, even though where we are at the minute, I don't think there's like a direct coherent line to that place. Um, but I also don't think it's impossible that we get there. Excellent. Yeah, really, yeah, really interesting. Thank yes, you. Thank yes. you for that. Um, I know we are rapidly uh, going, well, going towards the clock and maybe our audience might be patient enough to hang on a bit longer. Um, but I want to hand over to Barry because we've had some questions from the audience and we'd like to just chip those in um, as quickly as we can. Barry. Thanks, Minnie. It's brilliant. It could roll on all evening. I'm enjoying it very much. And Eugenia, we'll, we'll get a chance as well to, to bring you in also. So there are three questions that we've gathered and there's I'm going to of the 15 questions I noted I'm going to fit one at the end just because I'm going to indulge myself of the three questions I'm going to give one to each year if that's okay um Freya a question from Dominic Kion Dominic thanks for being here Dominic says Stormont may be in stalemate yet again but there are two important pieces of legislation looming from Westminster the Irish Language Act so the Octagaga the Ulster Scots, the, the Octagalia slash Ulster, Ulster Scots bill and the NI legacy bill. What effect might these two items have on a situation already complicated by the problems surrounding the protocol? And if I had answer, and then I'll put the question to Lisa and Michael. Um, thank you. And thanks, Dominic, for that question. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, that's a really good example of, you know, I, I suppose the, the other things that are going on that, that, that always have the potential if you like to throw another hand grenade um into this um already fraught situation um and there's also obviously the abortion legislation as well so one of the things that that we've sort of seen um certainly irish language and abortion came about because um the the, the assembly wasn't functioning in that sort of um three well the three-year period that was then um the assembly was restored in january 2020 but then um some of the legislation the, the agreements that brought back the assembly, the new decade, new approach, things then weren't implemented. So, so what you increasingly had was, if you like, was sort of devolution being overruled because things weren't moving in, in, in Stormont. So this is why the UK government stepped in on the Irish language. It's why it stepped in at the abortion. What it's doing on legacy is, is motivated for, for, for different reasons. But um, certainly in regard to Irish language and abortion, you, you have the UK government acting over the heads. And, and you can argue that there are good reasons or not for this, depending on your point of view, but it does raise questions about where the devolution um, settlements sit. And also you can argue about the effectiveness of the assembly and institutions in general, do we need to look to look at, at, at something else? Um, but I mean, in, in terms of the, the potential impact of this, um, on I suppose what's happening in, in Northern Ireland and also those kind of relationships with the UK government. I mean, certainly in regard to, to legacy, I, I mean, what's happening with legacy is, is remarkable. And I'm sort of assuming ev everybody is familiar with what I'm talking about, but basically this is, it's again, another unilateral move by the British government to introduce um, legislation, which will bring in um, a, a, a partial amnesty, if you like, um, for perpetrators. Um, who were involved um, in the troubles? Um, you have to sort of earn this this amnesty, and it, it'll also put an end to all civil cases and all, all inquests. So basically, for most families, it will close down any avenue of, of investigation. Um, this isn't what was agreed. So there was an international agreement reached between the British and Irish governments that the parties agreed to um, in, in 2015, the Storm House Agreement. This this isn't this, um, and this is a by everybody and this is why I say this is kind of remarkable in the Northern Ireland context because you have all the parties or victims group I mean everybody is, is against it apart from it would seem the British government and, and, and veterans groups um so so what you know what does this do in, in this kind of already really fraught landscape it, it, it just makes things worse you know there is another big bone of contention that can't be dealt with within Northern Ireland, but also then in terms of those international relations that the UK has with the Irish government. And there was really strong, the, the, the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, Michal Martin, was in Belfast on, on 
Friday um, and uh, meeting with all the political parties about getting the executive back up and running and, and about the protocol, but also about legacy. And it was really noticeable in the press conference afterwards. He was actually strongest about what was happening on, on legacy, you know, so all of these things kind of continue to poison, you know, they, they, they poison relations. And I suppose to touch on the Irish language um, briefly, uh, this legislation was introduced just today, actually. And this is something and this is something that was promised um, in uh, 2007, actually, um, at, at St Andrews. So again, long time, another feature of these things take a long time to be, to be implemented. And what was the reaction of Irish language groups? Um, really positive, um, but, but saying shouldn't have taken this long, but also saying, well, look, we need to wait and see what's happened. We are concerned that this might not be implemented because there is no assembly. We need to see the detail of this. So huge, huge levels of, of, of distrust. Um, and we've talked about that in, in terms of the protocol, but, but all of this is just kind of filtering through in general in regard to actions by, by actions by the, the, the British government, even with, you know, you can argue um, Irish language campaigners absolutely delighted this is happening finally, but there's still that level of distrust. Thanks, Freya. That, that was brilliant. And just, I think, because those who watch us or join us aren't always experts in the island of Ireland. And if I may, you lagged just at a key moment. And I think the point you're making was that uh, the, the most kind of sensitive topic of, of, of legacy the move, the unilateral move from Westminster has been opposed by across the board by the political parties in Northern Ireland. Isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, by, by, by political parties in Northern, Northern Ireland, by, by victims groups, by families, by the Irish government, by opposition yeah, yeah. parties in the UK. But, you know, and, and that, that's quite remarkable that there would be that kind of um, across the board. It shows that you can get agreement on, yeah. the, on certain things, yeah. I suppose. Thanks a million. Uh, moving swiftly on, I'm going to put one question to Michael. Uh, Michael, it's from uh, Dermot, uh, Dermot Gilvary, Harry Dermot. Question is a short one. To what extent uh, would the panellists, putting it to you, Michael, say that the UK government's public statements about the protocol are driven by its desire or indeed its need to provide material which is stridently pro-Brexit and anti-EU for consumption by its supporting newspapers? I agree. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, it's actually a um, version of a question I was going to put to the panel as well, but in, in the interest of time, Michael, I'll just take that. Uh, and I'm going to move swiftly on to Lisa. Unless you want to say anything else, Michael. Well, look, I just want to say one other thing, uh, because I didn't quite get into the GFA discussion, but I, I kind of want to pull out my longevity card again. Yep. Um, I never go anywhere without a copy. I've shown this before, a first edition. Right. And I think it's important to say it was long before the GFA is the agreement reached in the multi party negotiation. And it seemed to me we are in negotiation again. I mean, it's an ongoing negotiation, as Lisa says, but there's there's a couple of principles in it in the declaration of support. I just want to remind everybody that the parties dedicated themselves to achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust committed to partnership, equality and mutual respect strive in every practical way towards rapprochement within the framework of democratic and agreed relationships. And one thing I'm concerned about is we're now the minority dimension of majority uh, is the, kind of the conflict, if you will, between majoritarianism and minoritarian. You know, it was the minority was Catholicism, now it's unionism. But that means we never talk about the majority. The majority in Northern Ireland continues because we're against Brexit and the majority of MLA support the protocol. What role have the majority in these new arrangements? Number, and finally, I get really frustrated by the absolute exclusive focus on the assembly as an institution. As we're beginning to realize as the GFA comes into it, there are other elements and all their institutional and constitutional arrangements. And what the agreement says, they are interlocking and interdependent. Interlocking and independent mm -hmm. for their own success, and in particular, the functioning of the Assembly and the North South Council are so closely interrelated that the success of each depends on that of the other. So, if we're going to have a serious conversation about the sustainability of the GFA for its next 25 years, next year on its 25th anniversary, mm -hmm. then we have to broaden out the conversation into this totality of its institutional arrangements, its spirits, its processes, and its principles. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Michael. And it's really in the interest of time. I'm going to move swiftly on to Lisa. Lisa, there's a question in from John Cushnahan, who's a, a, an avid follower of our series. John, it's great that you're here and I owe you a phone call. Sorry about that. Uh, just a quick phone call, a, a quick uh, question, Lisa. I'll try and abridge it as I go. Mm -hmm. Would Lisa agree that the method of electing an executive under St the St Andrews Agreement is the major reason for multiple collapses of successive executives? 
And the best way forward for creating a stable executive will be, will be for the assembly to elect an executive by a qualified majority vote, uh, ensuring there's a coalition rather than the, you kind of touched on this. Do you think electoral reform of the assembly is, is an important way forward? Um, I think electoral reform of the assembly is an important way forward. Yes. Um, whether or not a kind of reverting to the pre St. Andrews agreement mechanism for electing first and deputy first minister um, deals with the entirety of the issues. I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're talking about qualified majority voting in the Northern Ireland context, um, to have cross community support uh, has a kind of specific meaning. Um, and there are two um, ways of achieving that. One is majority of the members present in voting include a majority of the unionist and nationalist designations present. The other is kind of weighted majority, so it's kind of qualified majority, but it's 60% overall, and then at least 40% of each nationalist and unionist designation present in voting. I haven't done this specific maths, but I'm pretty sure that it, at present the UP were um, pro formation of an executive. Um, so even if you factored them in for a qualified majority vote um, structure, to elect a first and deputy first minister, it wouldn't be sufficient to reach the cross community threshold in the Northern Ireland kind of legal setup and um, to move to a much more um, qualified majority voting. So you just had some, uh, so it was below the 40% um, or 50% requirements for unionists and nationalists present in voting. And um, that uh, would be quite, quite a substantial change. What none of that deals with is the other um, and the non-designated. Um, and just to say there are some kind of quirks uh, and things that um, are a bit irrational. So at present, the requirement to elect a first and deputy first minister, there are two ways to do that. Um, the kind of normal way and what we've seen so far is that the largest party of the largest designation um, elects first minister and the largest party of the second largest designation elects second uh, deputy first minister. Mm -hmm. um, this election result is actually the first time that the St Andrews agreement change um, or what one of them has been um, relevant and that's that if the largest party overall is not the largest party from the largest designation which is the case in this instance, so Sinn Féin is the largest party, but unionists are still the largest designation, then the largest party overall gets to elect the first minister and the largest party from the second largest designation gets to elect deputy first minister. What that also means if you play it out in the system for non-aligned, um, the alliance party in particular, it would actually be more politically possible for them at the minute to elect first minister or achieve enough votes to become first minister than it would to become deputy first minister mm. because it would be easier for them to be the largest party overall and use that St Andrews agreement process that Sinn Féin are using now or um, are eligible for um, than it would for them to be the largest party and the largest designation because to do that they would have to outflank um, all of the unionists and all nationalists, um, which is just that in itself is kind of a reflection of how um, the system has been designed or was designed particularly in 1998, but then has been kind of tweaked and amended for specific political moments to address specific um, kind of points of stagnation. But when you look at it overall now in relation to the political electoral demographic setup of Northern Ireland and the societal issues that we face here, I don't think it it fully makes sense. It doesn't match. Um, so I think electoral reform is required. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the details still need to be worked out. I look forward to reading your paper on it, Lisa. And listen, I'm I'm conscious that we we have run over time, right? But it's the it's the end, it's the last episode of the term and just for those interested in the recording i'm just going to push on for a little while longer i have a little question i'm going to invite professor Eugenie and then neve to sum up my question is a short question to lisa again but i know it would take a very long answer so do your best to keep it short i guess we're talking a lot about the rise of the center ground which obviously includes people for profit as well as alliance people talk about basically the non-designated unionist or nationalist talking about the unionists a lot but what's going on with the sdlp it's a time where around the world, centre-left parties are actually resurging. Nordics, Germany, Iberia, New Zealand, Spain, North America. 
what's happening with the party? Is it just in kind of in a in a bust phase and it's going to return, or is there something kind of bigger happening with social democratic politics in Northern Ireland? Lisa. Mm, I would be interested to know what SCLP would say to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the specific situation in Northern Ireland is more about, and perhaps they wouldn't like my answer, but I think it's more about the changes that we're seeing in Sinn Féin and the kind of consequential ripple effect for SDLP, because we haven't mentioned, but the um, rise of Sinn Féin in the South and the kind of move of that party um, towards a more um, center left policy platform, kind of de-emphasizing their traditional um issues around constitutional question etc um towards the policy focus i think the SDLP has um suffers from that shift and at the same time um and we could go into we could talk for another half hour on this but um when you look at the alliance uh, the makeup of the alliance vote whereas previously they were associated with kind of soft unionism and moderate unionism liberal unionism um, what we're seeing now is that they're getting uh, kind of soft nationalist votes um, as well. So there's a more of a kind of uh, diversity of the support for the Alliance Party um, that is to the detriment of the SDLP as well as to um, unionist parties. And that's a bit of a shift too. So I think it's like the SDLP are being squeezed in the specific um, Northern Ireland context. Um, the question around uh, liberal democracy uh, more generally, I don't think we have time to go into. Okay. But uh, Let's carry on the conversation uh, offline, though. I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on it. Professor Bigini has been extremely patient. This is my last word now. Professor, do you want to ask a question? And then we'll hand over to you. Indeed. Yeah, thank you to all the panelists. This has been a particularly exciting and uh, thought-provoking session. Um, and uh, just... Um, looking at these issues in a historical perspective and looking back at what everybody has been saying, I'm also thinking of Michael's initial intervention about the growth of the economy over the past few years. And then thinking at the solemn um, covenant, as the solemn covenant of 1912, mm -hmm. the main points were three. One was the protection of the economy, the economic prosperity, of, of, uh, of Ireland within the Union. The second one was, of course, uh, religious and civil and religious liberty. And the third one was the position of Ulster within the UK constitution. But now we have discovered that the economy has never been so uh, prosperous as it has been over the past a few years. And this applies to both North and South. It is no longer uh, an exceptionalism of the North or of Ulster, uh, except in so far as it is full employment. In terms of religion, of course, it is a sad story, the dramatic decline um, of religiosity in the South, um, but it is an important dimension which has changed altogether the scenario. And in terms of the constitutional position of Ulster within the United Kingdom, we have now established that the protocol um, affects um, inter-community relations more or less as a trade agreement with New Zealand would. So where is as the union is going? Apparently the contacts or the links or the connection with the covenant have long since been lost and they're certainly lost in the present situation. Where do you see unionist going? That to anyone in particular, Eugenio. Sorry? Is that to anybody in particular? No, anybody can respond, whoever feels motivated. Lisa has unmuted. It's a historical question. Uh, I would very quickly say um, that I think the answer to that question lies not in Northern Ireland, but in Westminster, and actions taken on the part of the UK government, and what that, what that forces uh, for political unionism um, to do, and maybe leave it at that. So I've been asked that question before, and what I've said is, and I, funnily enough, I appreciate you raising, I always go back to the Ulster Covenant, in fact, and the precise wording, which is the material well-being of Ulster. 
I feel that there's been a decoupling between political unionism and that core element, which is the first element in the first sentence of the Ulster Covenant. And that unless political unionism rediscovers and is fronts up to the connectivity, you know, to that connectivity and accepts the reality of what it means, first in relation to GFA, second in relation to the protocol, and in wider developments between GB and NI, which have been going on for 100 years now. And in even the construct of Northern Ireland itself, which as a matter of geography, lost three counties in Ulster. And in fact, its three largest urban centres outside of Belfast were all cut off from their geographic heartlands. So there's a whole sort of what I've said and asked the question basically is political unionism needs to re-engage fully and constructively and progressively with the reality of the 21st century economy that the island has today. Um, yeah, um, I, I basically agree. Um, and I suppose my my short answer will be is that th th this is the big question facing unionism. Uh, and I think unionism broadly needs to decide where it's going, because Northern Ireland is is changing. Um, and one of the challenges, certainly that the DUP has been facing has been this um you know, not not so much the, the losing of the vote to to the TUV, although that has been part of it, but the losing of the vote to, to Alliance. You, you know, there, there was um, uh, David McCann, who who works for the Sluggo Tool Northern Ireland political website, came up with a statistic, and it's brilliant, and I use it all the time. And it's it's that for every one vote they lost to the TUV, this would have been, I think, it was last year in opinion polls. They lost three or four to the Alliance. And and what what I what I'll, I'll sum up with is that if if you're a unionist and if if your biggest if the, if your biggest priority is the preservation of, of the union and the strengthening of the union and then where that goes next then how you preserve the union is by making northern ireland um a, a place for for everybody it's by making it a place for that 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 alliance voter uh, you know that that unionist who, who's maybe gone to alliance it, it, it's by making it somewhere for that sdlp voter it, it's it's by making it somewhere where everybody feels that they have an engagement and that they feel that that, that they can have, have have a good life in and their kids can have a good life in and they can have a job and and, and, and all of these kind of things so and and, and at the minute this this fracturing and, and and these tensions and all of this does not create that so i i think I think I think this essentially is the big question facing unionism. I think it's an existential question about where it goes, and I think it's also about where, where Northern Ireland goes um, constitutionally in the years to come. But it's the one it's going to have to grapple with. Neil, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, great. Um, I mean, what can I say? I mean, very very briefly. I think we've heard very different arguments about the protocol here today. Um, but actually it offers stability in lots of ways through trade, through other groups, through other voices that are now coming out through um, media representations, but also instability in terms of thinking about what is this wider unionist identity. And I think that in itself, like that the sense of political insecurity that our panelists have just mapped out, you know, what might the future of that actually look like? We've also heard quite a bit about narrative and how different parties have been packaging terms like the protocol or the Good Friday Agreement or peace or consent up in different ways um, that actually bear a little relation to the black and white that they meant back in 1998. So I think that's something to be cognizant of because it's certainly not a big point we get expressed very often in the British media um, sitting here in Cambridge and reading that quite, quite regularly. I think we've also heard quite a few solutions put forward today. Um, solutions in terms of what's effectively a softer Brexit ways to ease those trading barriers between Britain and Northern Ireland. But as we know, this is not a policy being pursued right now by the Conservative Party and has been packaged up again in different ways, particularly being packaged up in a way suggesting that Northern Ireland is simply a tinderbox. Right? The tinderbox, like it's always been presented, these two boring sides who are just about to kind of explode once again. And I think that actually obscures a lot of the progress that's been made in Northern Ireland over the last 24 years. So I just caution those of you who are tuning in today in terms of buying into that, that narrative. But we've also heard about electoral reform. I think Lisa definitely has a paper in the making about how we can think about Stormwind in a different way, how we can package that up quite, quite differently and how we can um, elect um, our MLAs in a way that actually represents the demography that it serves. So I think we've heard all of those things today. Um, I've just heard from Barry, who, uh, anyway, never mind, Barry, interrupting my flow of thought. Um, 
I wanted to thank you all very much today. Really exciting. What I want to leave you with are about, about six or seven questions I've been asked in advance that we won't get a chance to answer, but I want to leave you, the panelists, with them and our audience with them. Some are very party specific. The SDLP, is there still space for the SDLP in the Northern Ireland political landscape, or would it be better off joining one of the parties in the South? It seems to have been squeezed by the Alliance, really doesn't have a future um, anymore. Inclusive unionism presented by the UUP, does that have a future in Northern Ireland? It didn't go down very well in this election. Was that too far for unionism? And if so, what does that mean for the future of unionism? Media portrayals, I mean, we've seen it clearly in Britain and how they're talking about the Good Friday Agreement, how they're talking about the warring tribes, a term that's used and bothers me considerably um, in relation to Northern Ireland. And, you know, how do, how do political parties parties break out of that? How do they work with journalists to change images of them, of them that are being presented? Sinn Féin, you know, kind of break away from its shadow of the IRA, constantly used and referenced. And, and those of you who might have seen uh, Twitter um, today, various photos with Diane Abbott and other Labour MPs, um, with Sinn Féin members with Mary Lou McDonald and Michelle O'Neill, you know, some of the vitriol, which is part of the space of Twitter, but some of the vitriol that, that emerges after that shows that they you know, find it a very difficult challenge, challenge to break away from the IRA um, past, certainly among sections of the British public. Um, the Alliance Party, how they've been portrayed, you know, they've been portrayed as sort of the, uh, the plague on both your houses, unionism and nationalism, but actually does this in a way um, take away the credit of what the Alliance have achieved off their own back, their own creative agency in getting to where they got to in this election. Um, is Stormont even credible anymore? I mean, really and truly, if we can just decide that we don't want to vote for something, do we just make sure the whole house falls down? Has it lost its credibility if it's now collapsed five times since 2007? What are the pathways forward for unification? And indeed, the Republic of Ireland. We haven't talked much about the government today. It seemed relatively quiet in this recent chaos about the protocol. Why has it been quiet? Why is it just saying that it denounces the, UK, the UK's unilateral action. Is there something there that um, the Republic of Ireland, you know, why, why is there that sort of um, I suppose quiescence? So I'm going to leave it there and um, thank all my panelists today for a wonderful conversation and for um, the very exciting um, solutions I think put forward. And thank you all to our audience very much for your time this evening. And we will see you back in the autumn. So thank you again. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks Thank all. You. Thanks all. Bye.